Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for your word written and the hearing of it this day. By the power of your spirit, by whom the word was written, may you also speak to us this day through your servant Christ. Thank you for his humility. Thank you that he yearns that it might be less of him and more of you. May it be so, O oh God, that the bread of life might be given to each of us who gather this day, and that you might be given all the honor, all the glory, that everything might point to you, great God, we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Thank you so much for the invitation, and uh, thanks for sitting and listening, and uh, we're counting on the fact that the gospel has always withstood preaching, good or bad. <laughs> if you'll allow me to put on my vestments, I'll tell you a little bit about baking. I am a baker by trade. I started after my undergraduate finished at Hastings College in Hastings, Nebraska, and I started going down on Saturday mornings to a small sourdough bread bakery where we made bread by hand and baked it in a brick oven. It was a very special place to me, a place that became very meaningful and has become even more meaningful over time. Bread is an extremely simple thing. It really just has four ingredients. Flour, of course. Salt. Like, see, 
You already know how to pray. Prayer is about paying attention. It's about practice. These are things you already know. With that knowledge, bread baking became not only prayer practice, but a whole theology for me. While kneading dough, I grew in gratitude. I started making devotional danishes. I started making Christ-centered croissants. You know, I feel my hands sticky from these prayers, shaped mounds of faith. And I watched how yeast, like micro, microscopic, Holy Spirit, give life and energy. And I watched people eat. I watched people be fed. You know, in secret, hundreds of people every single weekend consumed my prayers. If the old adage is true that the pathway to the heart is through the stomach, I was one heck of an evangelist those years. <laughs> I had always prayed, it turned out, I just hadn't seen it. I needed to pay attention and I needed to keep practicing. I needed to remember what I already had at my disposal, what was already at hand, what I already knew, and not focus so much on what I didn't. You know, I think a lot about the feeding of the 5,000 because of the work that I do. Now those people had been trailing Jesus for quite a while. That's quite a big group, bigger than us. I'm sure as that day drug on, as they waited for something to happen, they were getting pretty hungry. And so Jesus, of course, asks his disciples to buy them something to eat, to buy them bread. And what is the response of the disciples? We don't have enough money to buy people bread. There's no possible way for us to afford to do what you have asked us to do. We can't do it. There is a bedrock economic principle to which the disciples are responding. It's called scarcity. Have you heard of scarcity? Yeah. <laughs> There's one economics professor here. <laughs> the principle of scarcity says that because there are only so many resources in the world and there seems to be an unending amount of want and need in the world, there's not ever going to be enough supply of what is desired. The disciples say there's not enough money and there's not going to be any time soon. We look at the problems of our lives, the problems of our society, the problems of our systems and say, you know what, there's not going to be enough money. Not now and not ever. This probably sounds a lot like your parents. Your parents would say that. Probably sounds, for those of you in churches, a lot like your finance chair at your church. We can't do that. We don't have the money. But to this lack, to this scarcity argument, the hot shot Jesus of John's Gospel looks at his disciples and says, pay attention. Pay attention and see what you might practice. There is a child here willing, already willing to practice what I have preached, already willing to share the little that he has. Five loaves and two fish. Heck of a feast, isn't it? Not enough? It's not enough. Pay attention and stop wringing your hands over what you don't have. I work for the Presbyterian Hunger Program, and because I do that work, I can tell you that there are 1.5 billion people living in extreme poverty on this planet. There are 16,000 children who will die today of hunger-related issues. There are 14.5% of U.S. households they don't know how they're going to put food on the table. There definitely seems to be a problem, and it does look a heck of a lot like scarcity. It does look a lot like a lack. Those people, those billions of people, gather before us. They sit before us together, waiting for a little gospel to drop down on them. 
And we, because we have called ourselves disciples, we are asked to feed them. Jesus tells us to feed them. And if we aren't paying attention, we might pull out our wallet. We might pull out our wallet and we might just leave it at that. We will, we will start a food pantry at our church. We'll serve in the soup kitchen on a holiday. We will count our blessings and we will say our prayers. And you know what? You should. You should do all of those things. But I wonder if that's enough either. I'm going to tell you that those are not bad things. Those are not bad things, but I don't think they accomplish what our key verse says to us. I don't think they, they sketch the problem quite accurately. The Lord has told you that which is good. And what does the Lord require of you? What is it? To do justice? To love mercy? To walk humbly with God? You know, I think about this verse often because it comes up a lot. It looks really great on our t-shirts. We will often render this verse as though it is an ancient catechism, as though it's just a question and response. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love mercy, to walk humbly? There it is, A and B. But there's something that comes ahead of that, something I think that's really important, something you might have heard your parents say to you. Son, I done already told you what's required of you. This is not a first instance sort of rhetorical flourish. This is a people, a people like us, looking for some other way out because what we have been called to do doesn't look very easy. We would rather do almost anything else. Do justice, love, mercy. Walk humbly. No, thank you. I would rather like to do a little charity. I would rather love people who look and sound like me and assuage a little bit of my own guilt. I would rather walk around being really thankful that I am not poor. That's what I want. But God done already told you what is required of you. You have been told to come participate in the miracle of our time. You have been, you have been called to respond to the needs of this world. Just as Jesus sat before that crowd of 5,000 and watched one of those hungry people bring everything he had to the table. God sat down in that moment. Jesus gathered what was there before him and in that moment made sure there was enough. We are in that moment. The poor of this world know what they have better than we know what they lack. They come before us armed with what they own. And we stand in the moment of miracle. The moment where we are asked to practice faith, to do justice. To love mercy. To walk humbly with God. They need us to stop believing that we have a hunger program. That we have a hunger problem. The problem is, of hunger does not exist because there is not enough food. There has long been enough food on this planet to feed every man, woman, and child. We have enough. We need to practice. We need to practice in a world where every one of God's children will be fed. They need us to do justice. They need us to advocate in the halls of power so that our resources are brought to bear for those who need them most. They need us to act against companies, to put our wallets away when people are grabbing land from those who are poor to line their own pockets. They need us to love mercy to loose the bonds of injustice. 
to end the cycles of poverty and underemployment and modern day slavery. They need us to love mercy by spending a little bit more on a t-shirt to ensure that a 15 year old girl didn't sit all day locked in a, in a factory that is unsafe for $60 a month to feed her family. They need us to buy fair trade. They need us to pressure the restaurants that we patron to buy their ingredients from farms that pay fair wages. They need us to walk humbly. They need us to walk humbly by investing our time and money with projects that develop the energies and resources of their local areas for them and not for us. Walk humbly. Walk humbly because we don't have the answers and they have some of them. Walk humbly so that sustainable food systems grow in every part of this world. Walk humbly so that the seeds and soil of God's earth are feeding the people that need them and not sold by the biggest corporation with the deepest pockets. We will be led by the poor. We will be led by the children. We will be led by those who already know the work that God is doing in the world. Pay attention. Keep practicing. It's not very easy. It's not even always that encouraging to do this work. It's pretty intimidating, and we have a lot of anxiety. Our whole life tells us there's not enough. And yet we have to articulate a gospel of enough into a world that preaches lack. We need to say that we know who has made it all. We need to forget. We need to forget everything we have been taught. Because we know the creator of all there is. In a world where we feel there is not enough food, that God has stared down into the chaos of our lives, into the chaos of this planet, into the chaos of our systems, and seen us, dragged us, told us, I done already told you what to do, dragged us to the kitchen table of grace, sat and kneaded dough before us, reminding us that we can have our fill, blending for us ample mercy, sufficient ability, extravagant relationship, and the untold power won by a savior who refused to become a king. We have all that we need. We will not this day or any day let ourselves be helpless. We will not sit overwhelmed by the problems we've misidentified. We will pray. We will practice. We're not going to be overwhelmed by these statistics and numbers and tricked into believing that they are the problems. We will pay attention in this moment. This moment of miracle. This moment be between the, the sharing of all of God's creation and all of God's people. And we will practice justice. We will love mercy. We will walk home.